Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us today for the Collaborative Mentoring Webinar Series. Um, today, we are going to be talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion, uh, and what that looks like in mentoring programs. Um, so we're so excited for today's conversation. I'm going to be kicking things off for us today. My name is Delia Hagen. I work at Mentor, the National Mentoring Partnership, and I'm based in Maynard, Massachusetts. It's a beautiful fall day here today, looking out the, at the leaves outside my window. Um, so if you haven't yet, please introduce yourselves in the chat. Tell us your name, um, maybe your organization that you're from, as well as what part of the country are you joining us from, so we can get to know some of our, our uh, attendees today. We have a couple hundred of you on, so we're really excited about that. And we'll also be polling you in a few minutes to get to know you a little bit better. So thank you again for joining us, and let's get started. All right, so before we get started, I wanna share some housekeeping information. Um, so all of you, if you haven't noticed already, have been muted so that we can keep the sound quality as, as good as we can for everybody. But we do want this to be a participatory experience. So we're gonna ask you to use that Q&A button at, hopefully at the top of your screen or on the side of your screen um, in your control panel to ask any questions um, of our panelists during our discussion today. And this is a very discussion oriented webinar, you'll notice there's going to be a lot of conversation and we want you to be a part of that conversation too. So please go ahead and, and share your questions as we go through and we're, we'll try to attend to them as quickly as we can. There's definitely probably going to be too many questions for us to get to all of them, but we will definitely do our best. Um, for those who would like to see some live captions, there are live captions available. If you click the CC button on your control panel, you can see it on your screen. Um, at the, it should either be at the bottom or the top of your screen next to Q&A. Um, Karina from Mentor and myself will be queuing up questions to share with our panelists throughout the webinar. Um, and again, we may not get to all of them, but we're definitely gonna do our best. Um, the questions that we share are generally those that really broaden or deepen the conversation that we're having. So um, those are usually those that we'll select to, to share with panelists. Um, and it, you can absolutely mentor, uh, reach out to mentor or, or the panelists after the webinar if you wanna ask um, more questions. We're gonna share some information about that at the end. So I'm gonna pause here and go ahead and launch some polls so that we can all get to know you all a little bit better before we start the conversation and try to tailor the conversation to uh, your needs as best we can. So the first poll that we're going to launch is about your experience in the mentoring field. So your choices are beginner, however you choose to define that, experienced or expert. We didn't put a number of years on that because it can obviously depend. Um, but yeah, let us know how experienced you feel in the mentoring field and we'll give everybody maybe five more seconds to respond before we share out our results. Okay. Let's see what everybody is, how experienced everyone is feeling. So we've got about 25% beginners, 61% feeling experienced, and then about 15% expert. That's cool. All right. Quite a range. Um, let me share the results out so everyone can see that. All right. So let's do an, another poll about your role in the mentoring field. So we're asking what best describes your role in the mentoring field? You can choose one of these. Some of you probably wear multiple hats. So you can feel free to choose other and then share in the chat a little bit more about what that means. But we have mentoring program staff or practitioner. We have mentor, educator, technical assistance provider. So mentoring expert who works with programs, consultant capacity, uh, researcher, or funder. So choose one of those roles. And we'll give about three more seconds before I share those out. All right. So it looks like we've got 75% of you are mentoring program staff or practitioners. 6% um, of you identify as mentors. And we know sometimes there's some overlap there. So maybe more mentors than we are seeing here. Um, we've got 5% educators and as well as some, a couple of technical assistance providers. All right, so our last poll is your experience with diversity, equity, and inclusion work. So we're going to ask you, what is your experience level with implementing diversity, equity, and inclusion work at your organization? You can select, I have no experience at all, I have some experience, or I have a lot of experience. We'll give you five more seconds to respond. 
I always like to give a heads up because some people are a little quicker, <laughs> quicker on the clicking than others. All right, here we go. This is what we've got. We've got about 13% feel that they have no experience at all. That's really good to know. We've got about 71% that feel they have some experience and then a lot of experience that's 17% of you. So again, a wide range and a lot of folks in the middle, but we definitely want to speak to all three of these audiences today. So thank you so much for weighing in. It really helps us tailor the discussion today. All right, hopefully everyone can still see my screen. Is that right? Audrey, give me a thumbs up. Okay, I'm just making sure I'm a little bit new to Zoom webinar here. All right, so we want to note um, before we jump in that today's webinar is being recorded. You probably saw that notice when you joined. Um, and in about one week, all of the attendees will receive an email with information about how to download a copy of these slides and view the webinar recording. You can also um, get this information directly from Mentor's website in the next week. So if you, if you feel like you want to grab those materials, usually about a week they're up there. And to continue to improve the series, we're also looking for your input. So we're going to ask you to complete a short survey that pops up right after the webinar so we can make sure to get your feedback right away. Um, it's only three questions and or it takes about three minutes. So please, please uh, complete that so we can keep making these webinars better. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and introduce Audrey Cruz, who is going to be facilitating today's webinar. So welcome, Audrey, and thank you. Thank you so much, Delia. Thank you, everybody, for being here. My name is Audrey Cruz. Um, and for those of you that are joining us again, you may have um, seen me on these before. I have been doing this um, as a facilitator for this uh, group for about six years now. Um, and today is a very bittersweet day for me. This will be the last webinar um, that I will be facilitating with this series. Um, so I'm incredibly excited that I get to spend my last webinar with two incredible panelists, Savine and Tara. Um, and today is going to be a little bit different than we've done webinars in the past. So rather than using slides in a presentation and more of that kind of traditional formal approach, we're going to have an honest conversation with these two incredible mentoring and youth serving practitioners who are working to implement diversity, equity, and inclusion at an organizational level and have been doing that for many, many years. Through this session, you're going to have a chance to learn from their experiences, how they've navigated challenges along the way, um, and how they've worked to create environments where people feel included and safe. We hope you'll ask lots of questions throughout the webinar. We will have um, Delia and Karina will be keeping an eye on that Q&A um, box so that we can bring forward questions as we go that are really relevant to the topics. Um, and then we'll also have some space at the end for any questions that we don't get to that are really well connected um, for about anywhere from 15 to 30 minutes, depending on, on how much time we have left so that um, you as an audience can, can be asking the questions that are most relevant to you. So please feel free to continue to kind of send us those questions along the way. And then again, we'll have that time at the end to really focus on your questions. So I'm gonna introduce our two panelists now, Tara and Savine. So Tara Span is a highly accomplished and enterprising people strategy, diversity and inclusion professional with more than 18 years of leadership experience in inclusive excellence, cultural transformation, strategy development and execution, process improvement and emerging DNI practices in higher education. She currently serves as the Chief People and Strategy Officer for Mentor at the National Mentoring Partnership. In her most recent role, Ms. Spann served as the Head of Diversity and Inclusion for Eversource Energy, where she led strategy development and execution, cultivated the corporate culture, created the first ever DNI annual report, and led Eversource Energy to the CEO action for diversity and inclusion. Prior to this role, Ms. Spann was the Director of Global Economic Inclusion and Supplier Diversity for Merck. Here she oversaw all diversity and economic inclusion efforts within the global supply chain while driving revenue, savings, working capital, and innovation for the company. She served as the internal and external spokesperson for global economic inclusion and supplier diversity and led Merck to be the first purely pharmaceutical company in the billion dollar roundtable. In previous corporate diversity and inclusion leadership roles, Ms. Spann was the associate director and executive lead of supplier diversity for Bristol Myers Squibb and Executive Director of Diversity Initiatives for Staples. Ms. Spann has worked for Harvard University as the Contract Manager, Government Compliance Officer, and Minority Purchasing Coordinator, where she accomplished maximum economic efficiencies through new, innovative sourcing and procurement processes. She has been featured in numerous publications. Furthermore, she has been the recipient of and responsible for a multitude of prestigious professional and diversity and inclusion awards, 
as well as a key leader on numerous boards. Tara, thank you so much for being here. It's wonderful to have you with us. 7A. 7A serves as CEO of Minds Matter, a mentoring organization that helps high achieving students from low income communities get into college with scholarships. He's been involved with Minds Matter Colorado since 2011. In July 2014, he was elected president of Minds Matter and was hired as the first CEO and first full time staff member in May of 2016, helping lead the organization to unprecedented growth in students, fundraising, and vision. In his past, Savine founded Focus Design, a social consultancy that helped education and social impact organizations unleash their internal creativity and innovation in search of solutions to some of the most pressing problems they faced. In this work, he traveled to 20 countries over three years, working with clients ranging from the Tennessee Department of Education to the United Nations Development Program in Kyrgyzstan. Prior to Consulting, Savigny worked at Denver Public Schools, leading the implementation of Common Core and Colorado academic standards across all schools within the district. He also spent eight years at Boeing managing major subcontracts in the aerospace and defense organization. He currently serves on a number of boards helping to further drive diversity, equity, and inclusion for these organizations. Savigny, thank you for being here. Um, so this is going to be a really exciting conversation. Uh, Tara and Savine, you have tons of experience um, in this arena and also really personal experiences that have driven you to this work. Tara, how did you get started on your journey with diversity, equity, and inclusion? Hi, thank you, Audrey, and um, thank you to everyone who's joining us today. Um, you know, I, I guess my first experience is just walking in life um, as a Black female. Um, and how to navigate through life. That's, you know, that's been a journey um, that I'm still on every day. But um, in terms of professionally, I really started my work um, when I was working at Harvard University as a contract manager and was working in procurement and uh, was assigned supplier diversity. And that's really when I started to um, work with diversity and inclusion. And that was through the supply chain and with um, federal contracts. So that was when I when I first got started with um, with diversity and inclusion. Thank you so much, Tara. Savine, um, you've described yourself as a first generation American immigrant and a third culture kid. Can you tell us more about how that has shaped um, your journey and your path with diversity, equity, and inclusion? Sure, Audrey. Um, and, you know, like Tara said, it's it's a journey. And I think maybe even um, more than most um, uh, people of color, I think mine has been a sort of a distinct journey. Because I came, as you mentioned, you know, I was, I was born in India, lived in Saudi Arabia for the first six years of my life, moved to the United States. And um, I did, I moved to Minnesota. I moved from Riyadh, Saudi Arabia to Minnesota uh, in September, which was a whole like weather shift, as you can imagine. But I think the bigger thing for me was, um, it was, for me, it was all about assimilation. It was how quickly do I fold myself into, at the time, I didn't know these, the terminology, but into dominant culture. So I didn't stick out, you know? And so it was about learning how to speak English with an American accent and, uh, you know, learning pop culture things and what uh, toys people, kids were playing with and what cartoons they were playing with. And so, you know, it, as a first generation student trying to learn this third cultural identity of like, what does it mean to be Indian American? That was something that didn't come along for the longest time. For, for me, it was about, well, what does it mean to be as American as possible? And now I understand American as possible means as white uh, and as white male, frankly, as possible, you know? And so that was my life for probably the first almost 30 years of my experience. Um, uh, I remember, you know, being, uh, you know, and unlike a lot of, I think, people of color who might have grown up in communities of people of color around them who looked like them uh, and maybe felt foreign once they left the boundaries of those communities. Um, you know, I grew up as in an Indian American family in a predominantly white neighborhood with little, you know, splashes of color here and there. And so for me, it was about trying to assimilate into white, um, white identity as much as possible. Most of my friends were my, white in my school. The people I hung out with at school, my school is very diverse, but the school that I, the people I hung out with predominantly white or at least behaved in that white dominant culture. Um, and so I just, I, I, I thought that was kind of normal, you know? And then I, even 10 years ago, when I moved from Boeing into education, I remember saying things like, I don't see color, or 
uh, you know, looking at uh, the the um, out of school suspension graphs, you know, at Denver Public Schools and seeing how disproportionately it was affecting students of color and not thinking that that was about systemic racism, but that maybe it was because of, you know, what the students were doing. And, um, so my journey has been even more distinct and really, really based in the last 10 years, uh, my growth around DEI, my understanding of systemic racism, systemic oppression. Um, you know, I, I, I think I have more empathy for people who don't understand and don't see the oppression because I was one of those people 10 or 15 years ago. And now I'm so clear on um, how persistent and inequitable so many of our systems are that it's, it's my work to go fix it. Seven, eight, you seem to have like a distinct kind of shift in, in your thinking around this, right? Like you, you are, you described kind of your upbringing in the early years in your um, career, kind of thinking one way about this and the shift that happened and how you think about it now. Um, what was the impetus for that? Was there a specific event that, that shifted your thinking around this or was it cumulative? It was certainly cumulative. Uh, and we'll get to this in probably some of the later questions, right? Where it's um, it's about that sort of incremental consistent growth over time. To me, that's that's the way to create persistent change is consistent movement over over long periods. So that's, that's a lot of my journey, but there were a few sort of hallmarks, you know, one of which being, um, my transition from the private sector into education came um, by way of a, an organization called the Broad Residency, um, and people might have heard of the Broad Foundation before. But they take they helped bring people from private sector into public education, and in doing that, part of it was a two year educational leadership program where we really started to wrestle with issues of race and and and, um, and uh, systemic racism, systemic injustice, identity, how we fit in as leaders of color in that community. So that was part of it. Um, I think a lot of it, frankly, was just exposure, though. You know, if I was in a very um, uh, sort of, you know, homogenous culture growing up in Southern California and the communities that I did, not that Southern California itself is homogenous, but the areas where I was hanging out were, you know, and so the last 10 years, ironically, I moved to Denver and I got more exposure to people of color than I did when I was in Southern California. We can wrestle with that later. But um uh, but starting to be more involved in the education community and people of color around me, starting to learn about their experiences firsthand. You know, um, I still remember hearing from a good buddy of mine, a, a black male um, who's, you know, uh, always dressed to the nines and, and getting in line at the airport with his first class ticket and having, uh, you know, sort of uh, white people dressed in, you know, uh, shorts and a sweatshirt, like kind of cut him off because they just assume that he's not supposed to be there. And it was little, little stories like that and anecdotes, micro, micro, um, micro annoyances, microaggressions, however you'd like to turn them. Um, starting to understand that and, and understand the lived experience of so many other people. And their lived experience allowed me to then reflect on my own lived experience and start to look at the things that I had sort of brushed off as not systemic racism or not um, systemic oppression as just sort of like that's the way the world works and reflect on those experiences and be like oh i might have been subject to these same um uh you know aggressions as well and i just wasn't aware of it at the time so it's it's this long-term journey but there are always those sort of um small experiences that that flick you a little further down down the road i think more and more people are becoming um aware of and in tune with the institutions that exist um, that are uh, creating disparity. Um, and I think, and I'm just gonna bring this forward because this is my last webinar, so I'm gonna be really straightforward with it, but a lot of our mentoring organizations were founded through white paternalism. And, and there are built-in institutions within these organizations that we're now trying to dismantle, actively dismantle. Um, but there is a, a process of discovery and uncovering um, that I think a lot of people are still experiencing and going through. Um, Tara, you have an incredible array of experiences in, in this work in many different industries and organizations. Um, so I'm sure that you've faced numerous challenges along the way. Um, what would you say are your top two to three challenges that you have experienced um, as you've worked toward implementing diversity, equity, and inclusion within your organizations? On, on mute. Um, the, yeah, the corporate world is, is something, you know, um, and that's where I've spent most of my career is, is um, 
in boardrooms, um, leadership teams, and yes, being the only one sitting there, um, the only female, the only black person, um, and sitting amongst literally just white men. Um, every now and again, you know, IT, it, it's, it's so typical. Um, the HR person is generally a, a white woman. Um, and the IT person may be, you know, someone of Indian descent of some sort. Like, it's so typical. I, I, um, and the challenges is just not being seen, not being heard, um, you know, uh, and, and that, that in itself was difficult. And it was progressive over time um, in terms of all of the different feelings that I was feeling as I was going through this. Um, and the awareness that I had, uh, just as Savane spoke, you know, your awareness grows over, over time and over many years. And um, it's just been, you know, it's been difficult. Um, and I, I could say that, you know, now that I'm working in a nonprofit organization, uh, now that I'm working for Mentor, it is a breath of fresh air. Um, there currently at, you know, at Mentor, there is no resistance in terms of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And there's a lot of passion around it. And we're actually speaking the language. And I can say words like anti-racism. And I can say I'm a black female and I can, you know, I can be who I am. Um, whereas in the corporate world, it's definitely a different language. Um, so that's been, you know, one, one top challenge. Um, in terms of the work and really, you know, the passion that I have for really integrating diversity, equity, and inclusion into different policies and practices within the organization, um, that's a challenge in itself, primarily because organizations are just not willing to do what it takes to change systems. Um, and, you know, they, they literally just, many of them, I, I will say, just, you know, give me a diversity, equity, and inclusion statement. Um, show your face to show that we do have a Black female in here who is in a leadership position. Um, you know, I, I can't tell you, tell you how many pamphlets, you know, and <laughs> flyers I've been on. Um, and so that's been a true challenge in terms of integrating it within the organizations. And then, you know, just DEI not really truly being a priority or business imperative until it is one, um, until there's a, a case, until there's something that happened, um, then it becomes a priority. They're ready to um, do a little bit of work, but just enough to quiet the people. Um, those have been challenges. And then the lack of transparency of what's happening in the organization. Um, it's, it's just literally, you know, it, that's another challenge within, within corporate, I'd say. And within many um, organizations, I've worked in higher ed as well. Um, and so, you know, just lack of transparency, lack of being able to, to speak the language, um, say exactly what it is, racism, um, and have people open their minds enough to receive that and understand their place in it and how they can help to change, you know, what needs to be changed for us to all be better. So those have been really um, some of the challenges that I've encountered over my, my career. So I want to unpack this a little bit more. Um, as you mentioned, you mentioned being tokenized um, yes. and, and really kind of um, highlighted and identified as a, as a beacon of diversity within the organizations um, and, and being othered and, and being the only voice. Um, how has that impacted your work? Um, how did that impact your work while you were in corporate America? And how has that impacted your work now that, you, that you're at Mentor? Yeah, um, you know, the word that I've always used over the years is demotivated. Um, I just felt extremely demotivated um, and just wondering, you know, how, how can I make a difference? Um, and, you know, do I have the power to make a difference? So that's, you know, that's, that's been, a, again, just a, a huge challenge. That's how it's impacted me and my, um, my motivation to continue to, to, to do this work and move forward. Um, you know, I had many things to fall back on and, and have thought about it quite a bit in terms of falling back to just, why don't I just be an engineer and just do, just go and be an electrical engineer and do that work. And maybe I wouldn't have to worry so much about, the, you know, the power struggle at the top and things like that. Or why don't I go on and, you know, do something in the legal field? You know, I, I, I had these choices, but I am who I am and um, that's not gonna change. And I feel like, you know, my work here is 
it's intentional and um, you know, it was given to me to, to really strive and continue to move this work forward. Um, you know, so, so that's, that's how it's been in the past. But um, again, I, I'll, I'll just say, you know, at mentor, <laughs> I'm, I'm having a blast. I don't, I don't know. Um, the, the people are, are great. We can have some honest, safe conversation. Um, and I'm just, you know, I'm tickled pink where I'm at right now. So everything's great. <laughs> there's a lot of work to be done. Don't get me wrong, but we know there's a lot of work to be done and, and we're, we're in for the task. So. So Tara, I have just one more follow-up question. Oh, Savana, I see that you're coming off of. No, 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 okay. no, 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 no. I just, I just, I just love, it. I love all that Tara's putting down. So I'm like trying to pick it up at the same time. Oh. <laughs> so Tara, I have one more follow-up question for you for this um, particular kind of topic, which is you, you brought up um, challenges and, and the top three challenges that you've seen. Um, so organizations that are not willing to do what it takes to change systems, D, not being a priority or a business imperative, and, and lack of transparency. Um, so my question is, what are the risks if we are not specifically addressing these three things or aware of these three things when we are doing this work? Well, time and time you've seen companies on the news, um, it was almost every day you're seeing something on the news where people have missed a target, you know, have missed it. That be, and, and you know they missed it because it's only white men in the room or white people in the room um, that made the decision. Uh, mostly I'm talking about like agencies, marketing, you know, they just missed the mark. Um, so for, for those, those types of organizations, it's, it's critical. Um, and for other types of organizations, it's extremely critical. I worked in, in pharma. Um, you know, and if you're not aware of, you know, certain diseases that are pervasive in certain cultures, <laughs> you're missing the mark. I mean, you know, that's a business opportunity that's, that's, that you're missing. So it's a business, it's, it's, I know it's an overused term, but it really is a business imperative. Um, and, you know, if, if, if we are not doing this on a day-to-day -day basis and including, um, the voices of the communities that we so-called serve, then um, you know it's it's you're just truly missing a huge part of uh, profitability, um, and also just in terms of your branding, you're just you're missing it. So, yeah, I mean, I, it depends on the organization, but I could tell you that there's always a risk. Savane, you have um, also a, a ton of experience across many different organizations um, from your consulting company and working in 20 different countries now to providing direct services to young people in Colorado. Um, what are the top two or three challenges that you faced implementing diversity, equity, and inclusion within organizations? Yeah. Uh, so first, Tara, I just got to say that uh, speaking of microaggressions, you got to see the number of times that I've like been in a room and people come to me when they have like issues with their computer. Uh, and the problem is I'm, I'm an engineer. So like I want to help them and I know how to help them. And so I end up just sort of like propagating this, uh, uh, this stereotype, but you know, I'll take it. But, um, you know, I, but I think, uh, I think, um, I think there's a few things, right? So like, as Tara, I want to build off of what Tara said real quick, you know, so when we talk about the a business imperative the way i think about it i mean it's 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 not that hard right like pretty much most of what we see in america has been built by white men predominantly rich white men right that's a third of the population imagine what we could do if like two-thirds or a hundred percent of the population were involved in building great shit sorry i just cursed uh, you know like it, it, but imagine imagine what could happen if we weren't li unintentionally limiting the people and the brain power and the ideas to just the people who have been doing it for 250 years or, or longer, thousands of years, you know? Um, so like the business imperative to me is, is a little bit of a no brainer. Um, and it, but it's still, you know, but everything that Tara said was, was sort of damning of myself, you know, you know, as, as the CEO of a small nonprofit that has been growing, that I've been with for 10 years, you know, in some ways I sort of think of Minds Matter as a bootstrap startup that happens to have 501c3 tax status, you know, that I'm running. And so in, in that regard, I have a lot of purview and I have a lot of autonomy and a lot of ability to make change. And the fact that we haven't uh, made as much change as probably we could have or should have in some ways is a lot on me, you know? And so where, where a lot of Tara's um, 
challenges were more externally facing, I think I could think everything she said, I could point to myself and say, I haven't been doing that enough, right? Um, I haven't been pushing enough uh, um, uh, across the the organization and the members of the organization. I haven't been um, treating this as a strategic priority and I've been more reactive and tactical um, in implementing DEI. I might have very good intentions, um, but you know, Audrey, you know, I talked about this, like, it, it, you know, you didn't bring me on here because I'm an expert at DEI and implementation and mentoring. I'm here to tell you, like, I, we're not where we need to be at Minds Matter Colorado, but we're working on it. And I can tell you where we're struggling and where we're having difficulties. Um, and I think a third thing is just the difficulty with, uh, you know, Minds Matter Colorado is a predominantly volunteer run organization, 99% volunteer run. We have 220 plus volunteers and only four paid staff, you know? And so, um, there's a distinct risk about making decisions that then alienate people and reduce the number of folks who will be involved as a volunteer, right? Like uh, if, if your salary's on the line, I can at least potentially force a more equitable system down your throat, right? Because um, then you got to quit in order to get out of it. But if you're a volunteer and Sabinet comes along and says, okay, we're pushing anti-racism, we're pushing social justice into our curriculum and into our training, and you don't feel like that aligns with what you want to be, or you feel like it's too politicized, you can quickly jump ship, you know? And so it's, there's a lot of decisions that have very tactical and immediate implications on the well-being of our students. Um, and so, so making those decisions have been difficult. And so a lot of, a lot of the challenges that, that Tara mentioned are things that I, I just sort of reflect on, on my own leadership and I think have been, um, frankly lacking if i'm authentic about it you know it doesn't mean that we're not making progress doesn't mean that we're not moving forward but but there's more that i can and and, and could be doing um that our team could be doing and we are doing good work um but there's more that we can push forward on um that we probably haven't for many of the same reasons that are listed seven i really appreciate your honesty with that and and for those of you um, who don't know, because none of you would, uh, Sabine and I have known each other for about six years, and we um, we met each other building a mentoring um, training together, um, and diversity, equity, and inclusion, and people's experiences, and um, understanding how that contributes and to a mentoring relationship, the challenges that can come with that um, were, were key components that Savane wanted as a part of that mentor training. Um, and so when I was thinking about who to have as a part of this, this webinar, I immediately thought of Savane because of his dedication to, um, to these initiatives and this approach and because he's constantly learning and growing and, and recognizes that there's so much more to do. Um, so I found that that um, honesty was something that that we really needed in this. So thank you, Savani, for for bringing that forward. Um, and I also have a, a really great audience question um, to piggyback on what we were just talking about. Um, so Michelle, um, thank you for this question. Can you all give some examples of how you would move your DEI work from the tactical reactive to a strategic priority? Um, so Savane, why don't you kick us off on that? And then Tara, I'd love for you to, to provide your insights into this also. Sure. Uh, yeah, great question. Thank you, Michelle. I think, um, and thank you all of you for joining. I'm just excited to see that there's 281 of you. Um, I think one thing I also want to say is like, uh, continuing sort of the real talk motif, like it's a lot easier to tell other people what they should be doing. Uh, and it's a lot of, a lot easier to diagnose external organizations than it is to to turn that inwards. And I think that's, that's been something that we've worked on, but, you know, I think it's a great question. I think, um, I think I can give an example of where I think we're doing it well. Right. And I, um, I chair a DEI committee for a board, um, uh, the, the Denver Metro Chamber Leadership Foundation that has been wrestling with a lot of this, uh, inclusivity work. And so they're building out a strategic framework. They've brought in a consultant to come help build out their strategic framework for the next five to 10 years. And we did uh, a very good job of building out and integrating DEI and a focus and a commitment to DEI all the way through the RFP that went out to the consultants. So every fabric, every decision that is being made in that strategic framework and that strategic plan, everything, like they write a bunch of stuff down and then we stop and we do like a DEI check and start looking at it from an inclusivity lens. How equitable is this? How, how truly inclusive is this? Are the right people in the conversation that we're, um, as we're building the strategic plan, every step of the way, we're sort of integrating an, an equity and inclusivity focus into that plan. So I think that's like one example. I think from our perspective, um, 
look, we're all mentor. 72% of us are leading mentoring organizations, right? Like we're all in, we're all trying to do this work. And as in almost every education institution or youth serving institution, there are a lot of fires to put out. There's a lot of reactivity. There's a lot of things that are happening because students, it's not because we are um, short-sighted, right? It's because many of us are focused on the needs and well-being of our students. And so often that takes on a level of urgency that is important in that moment. So I don't wanna criticize us for focusing on what the students need in the short run. There's nothing wrong with that, right? What the youth need in, in the short run, that deserves our urgency and attention. But when you do that sort of consistently and that becomes the day job, it's hard to, to then take a step back and look at the big picture and think strategically. So part of me, uh, my work is with my key leadership team every week, taking time to step back, look at our strategic priorities for the quarter and for the year, figuring out where DEI integrates into those. So as we're doing mentor recruitment targets, how are we making sure that we are building out uh, systems and structures to increase the diversity of our mentor population. As we're building out the mentor training and, and uh, evolving the mentor training that Audrey helped us with five years ago, six years ago, right? Like, how are we then making sure that we are bringing in the best of the most recent research and knowledge that we have, the current context, the environment of our students, and then implementing that in the revisions to our mentor training, right? These are things that require us to take a step back and evaluate and reflect on what we're doing so far. Um, that can be done. So those are a couple examples, Michelle. I hope that's helpful. Tara, what are your thoughts on this? How do we move from that more reactive, tactical approach to um, to strategic and intentional? Yeah, I think Savane said it. You know, the key word is integration. Um, and, you know, really starting with kind of awareness and education within your organization of, you know, what this all means. Um, but also within that accountability and ensuring that everyone knows and understands that everyone is responsible for moving this work forward, not the person who's head of DEI or has it in their title, but every single person. And primarily because they're the only ones, everybody in the, org in the organization, they're the only ones who can actually, um, you know, implement this work. Um, but, you know, the integration of diversity, equity, and inclusion um, does start with the like policies and practices within the organization. Um, you know, we just, everything we look at, you know, from our, we're doing a strategic refresh right now, and um, we're looking at diversity, equity, and inclusion, and how that plays out throughout the entire, and, and racial justice, how that plays out throughout the entire strategy from, you know, from uh, the exception of the work that we do internally to how we actually promote this work externally to our mentors and people who are being mentored. Um, and also from my perspective, being head of people and strategies, really looking at everything from hire to retire. So employee handbook, we just redid the employee handbook. And it takes time um, and it's gonna be, it's, it takes a longer time to actually do this right than it does, you know, to just do it. Um, so really having diverse people, you know, we have what's called the inclusion, diversity, equity, and, and action team, having them take a look at, you know, the employee handbook, having others take a look at different parts of the handbook and say, does this represent you? You know, help us help everyone else in the organization and um, getting their input so that, you know, they're a part of the employee handbook. They know and understand exactly what the policies are. Um, so we do that with our policies and practices um, and also with our external materials. So um, the elements of effective practice and the, the practices in these, these supplements that we have with that, um, you know, really talks to LGBTQ and things like that. So, you know, we're really looking at it both internally and externally. And like I said, Savane said it best, it's really about integrating it into every single thing that we do. And, and also, making sure that everyone knows that they are the ones accountable for this work. So, you know, that's, that's, that's the start. And there's ways of doing that. And it, it, it is an art. It's a dance. It's an art. Um, but because everyone has to feel good about what they're doing, right? They don't want to feel like I'm doing this just, just because it's something I'm supposed to be doing. So there truly is an art to it. To that point, I think, you know, I think one of the subtexts that we're talking about, that both Tara and I are talking about here, is like, it's not just what we're doing, but it's how we're doing it, right? Like inclusivity is not a, a destination or an outcome, it's a process, right? If we're being truly equitable, it's how we're approaching big strategic decisions. So it's not just something that we put 
on a goal sheet that we need to have X, you know, X amount of diversity in our volunteer base. It's what are the processes that we are doing? Who are we including in the process of developing our systems and strategies in order to be able to do this? How are we reflecting on our policies? Like Tara just said, our handbooks, you know, um, and, and who is involved in that process and how are we making sure that that's a truly inclusive process? There's multiple layers of this and it's not just, you know, checking off a box as, as, as you alluded to, Audrey. Absolutely. And one, can I just add one thing when, that was in the chat? So Ashley had made a good point when I was talking about making tough decisions and potentially that means that volunteers might leave. She made a good point that like uh, how many volunteers might join the organization because we've made those tough decisions, right? Because we've prioritized uh, DEI in our work. And that's a perfect example of tactical thinking, my fear of making the decision and strategic thinking, right? Which is what are the long-term implications? So I wanted to name that as well. That's awesome. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, I, so I just want to kind of bring attention to some of the things that you were mentioning with this. Um, I have been, as I mentioned to some of you before, um, working as a consultant and I do change management consulting a lot. And so um, you're really talking about how to make the change stick, how to actually make it a part of the culture of the organization um, and instituting it, right? So that it's pervasive. It's a part of your policies, your processes, your procedures, your performance management, your everything. It becomes a part of your DNA as an organization. Um, so it can't just be the goal that you're trying to achieve, but needs to be integrated into all of these different pieces to, to really become a part of your culture. Um, and the other thing is that it needs to be spread amongst many people so that you have the diversity of ideas coming forward, um, but also because organizational change happens through individual behaviors. Um, so the more that we can really include people in the conversation and help to enable our champions for this work, um, the more of a chance we have of this becoming who we are as an organization. Um, so this next question, uh, we had pretty different responses from both of you, um, but also kind of got to the exact same point. So, um, Savani, I'm going to start with you. What has been your biggest failure and what have you learned from this experience um, and biggest failure with this work, not in life in general? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, there's so many failures. Um, I think, uh, so yeah, this is funny because we talked about this, Tara. It's, it's interesting, Tara, and I sort of come to the same point. But for me, I mean, it's, gosh, the failures are consistent, constant, and every day. Um, you know, it's, all, <laughs> my joke is it's almost on everything, almost every day. Um, but but I, I don't want to be pithy about it, right? I don't want to be flip either. It's like, when I say it's failures, it means things aren't, aren't happening at the level or at the rate that I would like them to be. Um, so even if things are nominally a success and people perceive them to be a success, it might not be good enough for, for what I'm looking for. And so in, in that regard, I actually, I appreciate that, right? That means that I'm holding a high bar for what we're trying to achieve. It's not failing to celebrate the successes that we've had, but also understanding that there's more that we can do. Um, and I'm a big, big fan. Um, I'm a big, big fan of compound interest and this idea of growing 1% a day, right? Um, and the way you grow 1% a day, you know, uh, if you grow 1% uh, a day over a year, you know, that's 33 uh, times the growth in over the course of a year, right? Just 1% a day getting a little bit better. Um, and that happens through constant testing, constant failures, constant learnings, constant moving forward. Um, but I also use the the term failure in the way that you that you named it, Audrey. I know Tara has a different perspective and we can sort of reconcile that in a second. Tara, yeah. talk to us about um, what your biggest failure has been and, and what you've learned from this experience. Yeah, I don't own the word failure. Um, uh, failure is a system. Um, so so for me, every everything that I've done has been a moment of opportunity for me um, to, to think differently, to move the, the needle forward, to learn more. Um, so even though I may not have gotten to where, you know, I really wanted to go or where I thought, you know, everybody wanted to go, um, to me, it's not a failure. It's, it's a message. Um, and it's an opportunity. So, um, I, but I, I think Stephanie and I are saying the same thing, but we're saying it, you know, it seems like two extremes, but really it's, it's the same thing. It's, it's kind of funny, but, um, yeah, I just, you know, every organization with which I've been, um, I have made a difference. And for me, even though it wasn't nearly where we could have been, 
Um, I don't consider it a failure. Again, I blame the system. Um, and, uh, you know, I just try to do my work in it to change it. Um, so that, you know, for me, it's, you know, it, it's, it's, it's been, it's been a journey of learning, um, but not failures. To that point, I think, I think failure indicates a level of finality and there's no, there's no end in this, right? This work is constant and ongoing change is perennial impermanence is consistent. Like, um, we know that things are going to continue. And so, uh, so I, I sort of, I, 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 if I can revise my statement, I, I say, well, uh, I, I haven't failed, but I've not succeeded really hard. Uh, and, uh, and it's about not succeeding every day, learning every day, getting a little bit better and making the incremental improvements that compound over time. Yeah. And, and I would say even further, like if I had to do it over, right. Hindsight is 2020 always, but um, you know, then I wouldn't invest so much time and energy and heart into the places that I've been and the people that I've worked with who weren't committed to the cause. I, I would not have just continued to fight the fight, the fight when um, I, I would have put my energy elsewhere um, where there's momentum for a change. Absolutely. Um, so let's pick up that thread. <clears throat> about momentum and um, and the growth and learning that we've had. Um, Savani, what have been some of your biggest wins that you've experienced doing this work? Um, so I think I think there are a few, right? I think um, I think you know Audrey, the work that we did a few years ago, um, integrating DEI into our um, mentor training and now into our curriculum. Right, that was a focus that that was something that I, that we'd intentionally made a decision about around looking at identity and um, uh, social and um, personal um, elements of identity and the construct of identity and how that shows up in um, si si systems of oppression and systems of privilege. Right, and so we built that into our mentor training. That is now imbued and integrated into our curriculum with our mentors and our students, tenth through twelfth grade. Right, so that was something that started small. Um, but it was an intentional decision, strategic decision that we made and then sort of grew over time and has compounded and just been built fundamentally into the work that we're doing. The second is that example that I mentioned about, um, about um, the, the board that I'm on and the strategic framework that they're developing. And, you know, a year ago, uh, I don't think DEI would have been in the conversation. Um, but now for it to be deeply integrated into the fundamental foundation of how the strategic planning is, process is working, and the process itself feels very inclusive and equitable. Um, that feels like a huge one for me because that can alter the course of the trajectory of that organization over the next five to 10 years. And then I think the third is um, at Minds Matter Colorado, we've made and um, we've set a vision that we want to provide access to every student corner to corner across Colorado. So I saw a lot of uh, Colorado participants from Fort Collins and Thornton and, and other places. So hopefully we can connect at some point. But um, to me, that that takes on a the reason for that is a focus on a different type of equity than I think we often focus on. We often focus on equity when it comes to race, when it comes to gender, when it comes to sexuality, when it comes to other elements of identity. Sometimes we lose sight of equity when it comes to geographic um, uh, geographic equity, right? And so specifically, we know in Colorado that when you're in the urban corridor up and down um, what we call the front range of Colorado, there is a preponderance of funding, there's a preponderance of organizations, some really great uh, resources available to students. Once you get into um, further ex-urban and rural communities, those evaporate. Uh, and so we've made that commitment on our end that we want to do that because we have a 100% successful program. Every single one of our graduates gets into four-year colleges and universities with scholarships. And it's on us to make sure that we're um, being truly inclusive as far as a statewide mandate for this, uh, for the organization. So those are three of the big things that I think have been relatively strategic on our end that I'm, that I'm, uh, I'm happy we've been able to make progress on, knowing that there's still more to go, but, but um, successes that we've celebrated. Those are definitely successes. Tara, what have been your biggest wins doing this work? Yeah, um, my role, most recent is accepting a job at Mentor. Um, it's my first nonprofit um, and um, it's freeing. So accepting a job there where, where DEI is, is really imperative to the work um, that we do and our people are authentically committed really to creating and sustaining diverse workforces, inclusive workplaces and equitable policies and practices. So, um, you know, I, I really feel like I'm in a place where my work you know, and my efforts are making a difference. Um, secondly, um, I, one, 
one thing I, I one story I tell that that seems to be impressive with others. Um, I didn't know at the time, but um, when I worked for Eversource, one of the things that I did is really to help leadership connect with their own DEI experiences through reflect, reflection, recall, and feeling, um, so that they can speak with their own authentic voices when they're talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion. And that was a huge win for us because um, it humanized them and helped them to relate to other people and help them to be able to feel more comfortable, if you will, um, talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion when they can tell their own stories, right? So there was a, that was a long process, but it was one that was, um, that was extremely beneficial. And uh, I sit on a board as well and working with the chief diversity officer at this, at this company to really integrate that same thing with their, their leaders there. Um, and the, the other thing is really building valuable and meaningful relationships along the way. Um, every place that I've been, I have some extremely valuable relationships there um, still. And uh, for me, that's a huge win. Uh, so uh, Tara and Savane, you, you kind of both brought this concept forward of um, reflection being a necessary component of this work. Savane, that's a part of the mentor training. Um, and, and Tara, you you did that work with a leadership team and found that to be transformational. Um, could you tell us a little bit more, um, and, and Tara, I'll start with you first, uh, about why that reflection piece is so critical um, to help to move this work forward and, and what you do after that. Because I'll, I'll also say that I think that's part of um, a challenge that people face is that when they do that, right, when they have those reflection activities and people start to dig in, there can be a question of what next? How do we take this and use that? How do we make that actionable? Um, so two part question. Why is it important that reflection is a component of this? Um, and what do we do with it afterward? Yeah, I think reflection is extremely important. First of all, we have to start with I, right? Um, and um, so that's that's one reason. But also because if you want other people who don't look like us or who have who don't have the same struggles to move this work forward, they have to be able to connect, um, and they have to be able to speak with with their own authentic voice. Otherwise, people aren't going to believe them. They can see right through them. They've heard it all before. Um, so that's why it's extremely important important to really reflect as to, you know, when was a time that you actually actually felt excluded? You know, and you start with that question, um, and how have you experienced diversity, equity, and inclusion? Not what does it mean to you, but how have you actually experienced it? And having these pointed questions and having to get people who may not get it, answer these questions and see themselves in this and be a part of, is really um, momentous. It's, 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 it's also an opportunity to move the work forward. Um, what do you do with that? That's a very important question because I was thinking, you know, even though, even though I did this work at Eversource, um, I often wonder, because I left, um, wh where are they now? And, you know, people like to revert back to their comfort zones. What I did with them though, is I made them actually write a blog and I posted the blog um, on our intranet site during diversity, equity, and inclusion week for each leader. Um, and every leader had its day, had their day that, you know, this is, this is your DEI experience. This is their story. So um, they actually wrote this. Um, and some of them, I asked them to rewrite it. <laughs> I'm like, you're not there. This is, people can see right through this. I, you know, I'll poke holes through it. So that's one of the things that we did. So it, it exposed them a little bit. It made them a little bit vulnerable. Um, which hopefully opened them up to receive a little bit. So um, that, so in that particular arena, that is how, that is the next step that I took. But again, I think once you do this work of reflection and, and, and get people on board, um, it's, it's holding their hand and helping them feel safe to really expose themselves and be vulnerable to learning and telling their story and, and holding out their hand to say, how can, you know, how can I help this process? Like, how can I be your advocate for this? Stephanie, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, I mean, I think I think um, Tara mentions a really good point, right? Which is like, it's about um, it's about creating the the circumstances in the environment and the culture that allows for that 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 ability to reflect and to come up with sort of candid understandings when we do that, you know, and um, and then um, and then to be able to 
figure out, we go back to the same word again, right? Integration. How are you then taking what your learnings are from the reflection process and then integrating that into what do we do? And I think one of the things that ends up getting lost in the process is too often we try to do too many things because it's such a cathartic experience potentially, right? Like you get all these sort of understandings about yourself and then it's like, all right, I'm going to go be perfect tomorrow and I'm going to go do this, that, and the other. And so I always like to distill it down to one thing. What is the one thing? What is the one thing you're going to do differently tomorrow? This doesn't get you all the way to the end goal, right? But what is the one thing that you can take a step forward with tomorrow? And then I like to have an accountability. So this is like find someone else who's having who's engaging in this conversation as well and say, I'm, I'd like to check in with you. I'm going to do this one thing by Thursday, I'm going to have this conversation. I'm going to apologize to this person for this microaggression, whatever it is. I'm going to do this one thing by this day. Can you check in with me the, the, the next day and give them an email address or a phone number so they can check in with you um, to see how you've integrated it? Because I think that level of accountability and, and follow through is important. Um, and if I can just sort of tack on, uh, I'm seeing one thing in the chat right now, which is, you know, Bill had made a, quite a point about, uh, we haven't talked about how mere mortals can, uh, you know, can take uh, failures and then move forward. Um, I want to take the reflection, the reflection context, not just from the perspective of DEI, but I think it's also reflection uh, on ourselves and our, our failures, right? So when something doesn't succeed as well as we want it to, um, it's important on us as leaders to then reflect on our own experiences. And it can be hard sometimes to do that, to say like, okay, why did that go wrong? What decision did I make? How did I show up? Could I have shown up differently? Um, and to look at that experience. And that, to me, the reason why I didn't spend more time talking about it is because that's just really a constant, continuous process. At the end of every meeting, I ask my teammate, hey, what could I have done better? What's plus 1%? What's one thing that I could have done a little bit better this time? Uh, and then going and reconciling with that. I think um, I think there, there are lots of those situations where it's like, clearly I didn't do that as well as I could have. Um, what are the things, what is one thing that I can do differently? Again, not boiling the ocean, not trying to solve everything, but what's the plus 1%? So asking those around me that I have a great deal of confidence and faith in to, who understand me to say like, what's the plus 1% that I can do to move forward? And then the last thing I'll also throw in here is um, this is tough work. And we'll talk about this, I'm sure, in a second in the, in the, in the next question, maybe, Audrey. But like, this is tough work. And um, so much of how what we can accomplish is contingent on how we show up in the work. And so much of how we show up, show up in the work is contingent on how we reflect on our own experiences, our own traumas, our own backgrounds, our own identities, our own uh real relationships, interactions with others, behaviors, actions, everything, how we show up in those spaces um, can affect whether something ends successfully or unsuccessfully as a failure. And so I think the self-reflection as a leader is a constant and continuous process as well. And I know so much of my work has been around trying to deal with my own traumas and emotions and triggers when it comes to many of these conversations. And the more I've been able to process those on my own, the better I've been able to show up in those spaces. Yeah. And, and I don't want to leave Bill and John, you know, I don't want them to feel like we haven't answered the question. So um, I'm not one to sidestep anything. Um, but I think my um, mature mindset is different now um, in terms of how I think about things. Um, I, I'm not saying that I haven't hit up against a brick wall. I'm not saying that I haven't come home and cried, um, you know, because I feel like, you know, the day just was not a good day. Um, but I always, I always did get back up. I always had either um, confidants or um, mentors that would just be honest with me and talk to me about it and tell me how to move incrementally forward. So for me, they, they never, a failure is, is an end. You know, it's like I failed, that's it. So yeah. even the person that runs a race, falls, gets back up, they haven't failed. Um, so for me, that, that word failure maybe is not, you know, is not the, the best word to get to the point maybe that, that Bill and John would like for us to get to. But um, in all honesty, I've hit brick walls um, yeah. a lot, a lot, a lot. So, um, you know, there's, there's stories to tell on that for sure. So maybe this question, we'll, we'll get to it a little bit more as well. And then this is gonna be my last question before I um, uh, turn over to our audience questions. Um, so, uh, kind of in this vein of failure or challenges, um, Savani, could you tell us about some of the tough decisions that you've had to make over the years to integrate diversity, equity, and inclusion at an organizational level? Um, 
Yeah. The toughest decision is the consistent one that I think a lot of us don't want to talk about, which is how inclusive is inclusive, right? Um, who are we inviting into the table? For a long time, I've said it's not on the oppressed to dismantle the systems of oppression. It's on those who benefit from the systems of oppression to dismantle the systems of oppression. But a lot of times that means bringing in people who have power and privilege um, into conversations where they may feel like you're diametrically opposed, right? Um, and so the easy, I'm, I'm gonna be bold, like this is your last webinar, Audrey, so I'm gonna say it, but like the, the easier thing, at least in my experience, is to not bring those people to the table, not bring the people with power and privilege to the table because they might believe things that are antithetical to what I believe, because they may say things that are triggering, because they may believe things that are um, that 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 make me feel unsafe um, or make me feel like my my uh, my ability to persist in this world is is at risk. Um, and I think I think we lose a lot of opportunity. Uh, and a lot of ability to actually change and dismantle the oppressive systems if those people aren't at the table. And so, so, so much of what I'm working on, we talked about self-reflection, so much of what, what I'm working on is how can I empathize and understand with perspectives that are diametrically opposed to mine? Understanding that that doesn't mean I agree. That doesn't mean that I don't feel super peed off about it and frustrated by the whole experience, right? And that I couldn't feel like more angry about it. Like I may feel all those things, but that doesn't mean that I can't create space to empathize and understand with a perspective. For a lot of my friends and colleagues, that is triggering. They will not get into those spaces with people who feel diametrically or believe diametrically opposed from what they believe. And they will not include those people in the conversation. I'm wired differently as hard as it is. I need those people in the conversation. That doesn't mean I honor or validate what they're saying, but I honor and validate their humanity as individuals. And I will say that a lot of the backlash, there's a question about how do you handle leadership who may not believe what you believe or may not be on the DEI journey. I've found that sitting and listening has been able to lower the barriers so much more effectively than taking a firm stand and saying, I'm not going to listen to you if you don't agree with that is the toughest decision that I have to make every single day when I'm trying to engage in this work. Um, but it has also been the most effective decision that I've made is the willingness to empathize and understand and listen to everyone and honor their humanity as full, worth full humans in spite of their belief systems and understand the fundamental uh, um, assumptions and beliefs behind those belief systems in order to understand and then how to move that forward. Stephanie, thank you for bringing it up. I think that that is um, such a valuable concept in the, in the current polarized um, kind of social setting that we live in at this point and, and um, being able to understand different perspectives really helps us to, to drive this work forward because we can understand those different viewpoints and experiences as well um, and bring them into those conversations. Tara, what are some of the difficult decisions that you've had to make over the years? Yeah, I, if I look at my career over and over, I had to make the decision of, do I um, stay, play the game and succeed? Or do I remain authentic to myself? Um, that, has, that has been the question over and over again as I walk through the doors of, of these buildings every day. Um, and I, I must admit, you know, that, um, you know, I've tried to play the game sometimes and um, and I knew exactly what to do to play the game sometimes. Uh, I knew exactly what to do to get promoted, how I should look, what I should say. Um, and, you know, I can say that, yeah, it works, but it didn't work for me. Um, you know, um, I, something was not right. So um, that's I, I would just kind of leave it there and say that's really the biggest step, I mean, the biggest decision that I've had to make every day um, in the past um, throughout my career. All right, um, let's move this over to some audience questions. Savane, you, you brought this question up and started to address it. So um, I'd like to bring this um, forward for Tara as well. Um, so are there ways to move work forward that can include individuals in leadership um, who might exhibit defensiveness when implementing DEI policies and processes? 
So Tara, what's Yo, your perspective on that? Go, oh, seven, eight, go Tara. Okay. No, Tara, you go first. Uh, she's, oh, she's pondering. She's got a oh, great, great uh, thought. No, you go not, first. No, I, want no, to hear, I want to hear your thing. Can you repeat the question? Sorry. <laughs> yes, absolutely. No problem. So um, we uh, started, Seven, eight, started talking about this in, in his last response, this idea of um, like bringing along individuals in leadership positions, people who are critical to moving this work forward, who might be defensive or oppose it or think it's not important. Um, what are your thoughts on, on approaches we can take if that dynamic is in place, if leaders aren't fully on board or they've got, they're digging their heels in or they just want a DEI statement? <laughs> um, well, in my older age, I just say, okay, you don't need my consulting experience um, <laughs> and keep it moving. Um, but I would say, um, you know, when I work in these environments, like, you know, I'm always thinking of different ways of doing it. And, and, I always believe that they have to experience DEI to really be able to see themselves in it and work forward. Um, and how do I, so the question I always say is, how do I get them to experience this? Um, as opposed to, you know, how do I get them, like I said, telling their own story or um, there's actually, you know, audio visuals um, now, you know, 3D, putting yourself in the shoes of others. Like there are certain tools now that, um, I have actually utilized as well to get leaders to kind of, you know, trying to get them to an aha moment or at least tweak them a little bit to say, hmm, you know, may maybe there is a point here. Um, but I, again, I think it always starts with self. So I'm always thinking about how do I get this individual to, um, to be a part of this, this movement? And I, I have to look at what has been their experience. And so... Yeah. 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 I totally agree. I think um, in my experience, what I found over and over again, and uh, Tess, hi Tess, uh, Tess had asked a question about like, um, can I give a concrete example of what this has looked like? You know, I, um, in my experience, what I found is people want to be listened to and understood more than they want to be liked. I've seen that over and over and over again. And when people don't, aren't given a space where they're listened to and understood, then it just becomes, they get louder and louder and louder and more firmly grounded in the fact that I am right, you are wrong, I am right, you are wrong. And that doesn't get us to a productive place. And so creating this, I can tell you the number of times that I've had conversations with leaders of boards that I'm on or board members on uh, of my organization where um, you know they don't want me to use the word anti-racist somewhere or they don't want us to focus on um, on uh, changing the demographics of our volunteer mentors will, you know, get the best mentors and volunteers who will come along. Or there are conversations like that that I've had countless times in the last 10 years. And in almost every single situation when I've sat down, when I've, again, empathized and tried to understand and put my own emotions and triggers in check um, and just given them a space to vent and to share their opinion and for me to listen and to process as objectively as possible, uh, this is where my meditation practice comes in very, very healthy, uh, help, uh, hopefully. But um, when I've been able to give people that space, I've found that their barriers and guards have dropped and that we can have an actual productive conversation about how to move forward. Often the very things that they are, um, they seem like they're against putting anti-racism in or focusing on the diversity of our volunteers are not actually what they're against. They're against this concept or this construct that they feel is battling them. And once you can push that out of the way and say like, that's not what we're fighting about, right? This is about a very tactical decision. Often I found it once they've been understood that they're willing to, both of us are willing to, to engage and move forward productively. Um, so that's, that's, a, that's a, an example of, of where I found this to be helpful. Thank you both for that. Um, I have another audience question, which um, I feel gets to a lot of different things we've been discussing. Um, of how inclusive is too inclusive, um, you know, on this on this kind of journey, um, how should we be screening mentors for where they are on their DEI journey? Um, and kind of given the context of like wanting this to be transformative for the mentor as well, um, where's the line with that of, of being able to bring people in who, who might not be very far on their journey, um, but ensuring that it's not to the detriment or emotional safety of the mentees? What are your thoughts on that? Sabine, we'll start with you. 38 percent. 38. They have to be 38 percent on the journey. That's where they're. No. Um, 
for it's 37 everyone knows that uh, <laughs> no um uh one of the things that we say at Minds Matter is it is more important that you are willing to go on the journey than where you are on the journey, right? It's it's about your willingness and your um, your willingness to engage, your willingness to reflect, your willingness to to struggle with some of the tough conversations, and to be a part of it. I have mentors that are very early on in their journey. Does that mean that we need to do some additional potential extra facilitation or monitoring when we are in sessions talking about identity to preserve the safety of our mentor mentees? Absolutely. Um, so that's not to say that we are not being equitable in how we are facilitating the experience, right? And making sure that we're differentiating based on the needs and where people are on the journey. That's just education 101 is differentiating based on where people are. Um, so we try to make sure that we do that, but we're not going to exclude someone if they are not X far on the journey, um, as long as they are willing to participate in the journey. I, I just agree with that. I really don't have much more to add. Yeah. You disagree or you agree? No, I, I will just agree with that. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I disagree with you. I think it's 38%. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I wonderful. Um, all right. So I, I would like for each of you to provide a, a tangible example of one thing that you feel is um, a very effective strategy or approach um, that you've taken to implementing DEI in your organization. And, and I'm going to also kind of um, preface this with, um, we know the research um, around trainings associated with this at this point is that um, a lot of organizations train their employees and train people about diversity, equity, and inclusion, and we're not actually seeing shifts um, in, in the culture of the organization or the way that we're doing things. So um, given that kind of framing statement, um, what has been one of the most impactful approaches, um, modalities, things that you've used to actually move the needle on this, to make this a part of the culture of an organization? And Tara, let's start with you on this one. Hmm. Um, one, you know, one, one thing I think is important is, is creating trusting relationships within the organization and creating a safe space so that we can have a conversation so that we can know and understand what's happening in the organization, what the concerns are um, so that we can address them and make sure we're addressing them and the things that we do every day, the practices and policies that we're putting together. So um, that to me is, is extremely important. Um, wow, um, what else have we done? Um, let me, let me think on that for a minute. There was something else that I thought about, but but, but let me think on it. I'll, I'll vamp while Tara comes with a haymaker. Um, uh, I think uh, I think a couple of things. So I think uh, so, Audrey. I, I'm with you. That training usually sucks, um, but uh, that's because most training is about um, at least a lot of trainings that I've seen have been around uh, giving information to participants, not around participants reconciling and reckoning with the information and their own experiences in the process. So I think conversation um, and deep like uh, individual small group and whole group reflections in the training where it's 2% someone talking at you and 200% you sitting and trying to figure that out. Sorry, I'm on a ranch so there are dogs barking in the background. Um, but uh, I think that's, that's really important. That's what we found is the more space we've created for conversation um, and well-facilitated conversation, I think that's helped move things forward. I think the other thing, I'm seeing this in the questions, so I want to answer this at the same time too, but like the question, small nonprofits were understaffed. How do we focus on DEI? What percentage of our effort should focus on DEI? Um, I want to push I want to push on that thinking because that feels very fixed pie on that thinking. I think it's not like 20% of our effort should focus on DEI. I think if you're thinking about it that way, you're probably thinking about it in a way that's not going to be effective in the long run. I think the important thing is what I mentioned earlier and what Tara and I also mentioned, right? Which is it's, it's as much about how we are doing the work as it is and in integrating it as it is what we are trying to accomplish, right? So DEI is not about certain targets or metrics, but it's a whole system approach about how are we doing the work that we do? And let me tell you something, the more inclusive and the more equitable the work is that you are doing, and the more inclusive and equitable the processes that you're doing, the more effective they're going to be in the long run. That like, so you are, this isn't just about DEI for DEI's sake. It's about pushing things forward in a way that is equitable and inclusive and brings in a diversity of perspectives. 
that allows us to be more effective in the long run. So it does take some effort to alter our processes and our procedures and our culture and how we set up meetings and how we set agenda items and outcomes and measure stuff. All of those things, uh, adjusting those takes some time and effort, but it's in service, not only of DEI, but it's in service of more equitable outcomes for our organization, for our students. Yeah, and you know, again, integration into all of all of the business that we do is extremely important. That's that's the most successful thing you can do. Um, but in terms of also trainings, yeah, it, it, I consider learn. I, I do learning journeys. Um, you you could best believe that in every strategy that I do, um, every single year, you're going to see um, awareness and education, and you're going to do that. We're going to do that in various ways. And it's constant. It never goes away. Um, so, you know, this, if you have a training, you can best believe there's going to be a 2.0, 3.0 or some way that you're going to have to execute it down the line. Um, so it's always a learning journey for us. Um, and, and so I think, you know, looking at it that way and continuously having these things, just don't stop, just keep having conversations and, and uh, bringing in ex experts, even externally, keep it interesting, um, learning different experiences. Um, you know, that's going to, that's going to move the needle as well. A lot of not failing on the way. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's not final, right? That's one of the things that I think Tara, yeah. you're really bringing forward is that, um, a, a lot of challenges with some of this work is when it, it is that end destination, that thing that we do that then is going to just dramatically shift the way that we work. Um, and it's a starting point. And then there needs to be a next step in the journey and a next step. And, and it's never actually going to end. It's just going to keep going on. And we're going to keep discovering and uncovering new things that we can be doing um, to better represent our country and, and who we are as people, um, that diversity that's so necessary to drive our work forward as organizations. Um, and I don't, I don't, I just want to add to that, Audrey, I don't find that exhausting. Uh, I had to do the perspective shift where like, oh gosh, this is a lot of work. No, like it's those little improvements that are actually fun. When you see someone who would come from a certain perspective now alter the way that they're, they're showing up, that's fun. So, and we will get better at this as we continue to push on. Um, but it's a lot like, you know, pushing a gigantic boulder. You can keep pushing the same amount of effort um, and you push and push and push. And at some point you you make a little bit of progress and it moves forward and then it gets stuck on a new rock and you keep pushing the constant pressure. It moves in, in big chunks and then feels like it's not moving at all, but that shows that you're making progress. Absolutely. Um, all right, so we are at uh, 2.19 Eastern time. So we have only 10, 11 more minutes um, of this session. So I have a couple more questions, um, one from the audience and then one that I'm probably just gonna wrap up with. Um, so we talked, Savannah, you mentioned the diversity of programs within um, Colorado. I'm, I also live in Colorado um, and you know there's a, a huge difference in, in um, kind of those urban larger programs and some smaller rural programs. Um, and so I, I wanna focus on, on diversity of size of organizations in this um, and, and really, um, I'd like to hear from both of you of any tips that you have for smaller nonprofits um, that are struggling to implement this while battling some of those ongoing understaffing, underfunding challenges um, that make it difficult to even do the day-to-day -day work. So what structures, proactive steps could a smaller organization set up to be able to create the time and space for implementing DEI um, while also continuing to manage some of those other challenges um, in the day-to-day -day work. Savani, why don't you kick us off with this one? Um, as a small nonprofit, uh, the thing that has been most important for us, and we're not great at it, but we're getting better, we're improving, right? Um, is, uh, man, it's focus, it's being, uh, we forget that sometimes the word priority, the, the root of the word priority means uh, like it's one thing, right? And so we set 12 priorities for the organization or 28 for the year. It's impossible when you're a small organization. And so it's saying no to things and it may be not no final, but it may be not now, right? Um, but like saying no to things. And one of the things tactically that we do is we set our seven goals for the year we distill those down to four each quarter and each of our departments takes one of those things. So that is the priority that we're trying to focus on. 
Um, and a lot of times the process by which we're going about doing that is an inclusive process. We're trying to be equitable and bringing that equity or inclusivity lens into the process of building those, um, those goals. But like the answer is saying no to stuff. That's really hard to do when you're a youth serving organization, but that's what we found. It's like, you got to say no or not now to things and say, we'll do that next quarter or next year. But right now we need to focus on these things. That's the only way to manage it. I found from a small nonprofit perspective. And I would also say that um, the small nonprofits uh, probably have a lot of partners, external partners that they work with. So, um, you know, I think emphasizing shared values and ensuring that they're also moving that, that, um, that work forward um, and reflecting it back into your organization with the work that they're doing with you is one way to kind of keep um, DEI at the forefront of, of the work that, that you're doing. So use them as your additional resource um, in this work and um, just, you know, make sure that, you know, in any contract or, you know, things that you're doing, I, I do it all the time. You know, it's like, yeah, have you taken a look at your board lately? Have you, I'm looking at your leadership and I'm saying, I mean, I'm, I'm having these conversations with our external partners and I am, you know, kind of forcing them, if you will, to focus on this as well. Um, if you want to do business with us or if you want to work with us, then we have to have some shared value. So I say that, you know, that's one thing that you can do that doesn't take resources, additional resources. Yes, plus one to that. All right. So my final closing question for us, um, <clears throat> Tara, we're going to start with you on this one. Given your journey and what you've learned along the way, what closing advice do you have for our mentoring and youth practitioners on this call? Oh, you are uh, muted. Doing that because um, I have I have a dog in the background and he's he's pretty uh pretty energetic right now. So um, <laughs> yeah, I, I just want to say this is this is hard work, um, and 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 but it's meaningful work. So I, I would just say please, um, just as I have had to do, I've had to, you know, like when I when I said I hit a brick wall, I, I still have to keep it going, you know. So keep on the path and make a difference. Um, also, most importantly, and we talked about this a little bit, I think Savani mentioned it in terms of listen to and trust in and invest in the voices of our youth. Um, at the same time, gently guide them um, and lead them to and, and help them feel protected as they're journeying on. Um, I think, you know, they're, they're the ones and they have the power to really change the world for the better. Um, so I think us empowering them to do so um, supportively is, is huge. So um, that's mentor up and, and, and make, things, make things happen. Savane, what about you? What, um, what advice do you have for our mentoring and youth serving practitioners as we close out this webinar? Uh, I think it's just sort of a summation of what I've said throughout and what Tara just sort of mentioned too, which is, this is a long journey. Audrey, you mentioned there's no end. Uh, there will be highs, there will be lows. What matters is our persistence and our consistent effort towards justice. Um, and that's that can be very, very hard. So 1A is, um, uh, for me, the most important thing has been focusing on my own self, uh, working through my traumas, my experiences, my ability to respond to situations intentionally as opposed to reacting um, based on uh, triggers or emotions, um, being thoughtful, being strategic, but it's all my work on myself as a leader that prepares me to be able to do this long-term journey and this long-term work. Absolutely. Well, Savane and Tara, thank you so much for being with us today. And thank you so thank much you, Tara. For, thank you, Audrey. <laughs> for spending um, thank my you. last webinar with me. I, I cannot thank I you. cannot possibly imagine um, two better people to be with. Um, <laughs> and Delia and Karina, thank you for being here and being a part of moderating our questions and queuing them up. Um, and I will kick it over to you, Delia, to close us out. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. And this was just such an amazing conversation. I really learned a lot myself and um, have the pleasure of working with Tara every day, but learned a lot hearing your story and yours as well, Savane. So thank you so much, everybody. And Audrey, congratulations on your last webinar. It was such a pleasure thank having you. you. Thank you so, so much, so everyone. <laughs>
Yeah, so I just want to just close us out with a couple quick reminders for those of you who may be newer to mentor and some of our resources. We want to just direct you to our affiliates, our local and state affiliates that are all over the country doing the work that we do, but on the local level and have a lot more to share in terms of local resources and training and technical assistance available to you. Um, so you can click these links once you receive this deck within a week on the page that I shared in the chat. Uh, we also have the Mentoring Connector. If you're not listed there as a program, check that out to, to recruit more mentors. Um, and if you're a mentor or a parent and you're looking for a mentoring opportunity for yourself or your family, that's a great way to uh, check that out as well. We have the National Mentoring Resource Center, which is just a really fantastic resource hub for all mentoring practitioners to check out. Um, and then finally, we just want to just remind you about the survey that's going to launch as soon as we close out today's webinar. It's just three minutes of your time, but we really appreciate your feedback. It really helps us keep this series as relevant as possible to what you're looking to get out of it. Um, and you'll also, if you registered for this webinar, which you did, you will receive an email with all of the uh, information, the slides, uh, as well as the recording for today's conversation. Um, you can also email us here if you have questions. Um, I did share the email addresses for our two presenters um, and their organizations in the chat if you want to reach out with additional questions, but you can also reach out to Mentor. Um, and then finally, uh, would like to remind everybody about our next webinar, which is coming up uh, on October 22nd at 1 p.m. Eastern time on mentoring LGBTQ plus young people. So very excited about that conversation as well. We plan to bring some practitioners and researchers together to talk about cutting edge resources and um, some exciting assessment work that's been done on that front. Um, over the past year. So really excited to have all of you uh, join us again. Can't thank you all enough for your thoughtful questions. And again, want to say thank you to Tara, Savine, and Audrey for uh, such a wonderful, helpful, actionable conversation. Um, so thanks everyone. And we'll see you in October.